Welcome to lecture 43. In this lecture, I will talk about the ADS CFT correspondent. So far, we have focused on applications of general relativity to astrophysics and cosmology. However, there's another application of general relativity, quantum field theory. This curious way of applying GR to solve quantum field theory problems is because there is a conjecture duality between general relativity on the one side and quantum field theory on the other side. This duality originally came from string theory and is known as the ADS-CFT conjecture. This duality is very powerful and it uses general relativity methods to solve hard problems in quantum field theory. Because it's an important application of GR, I thought that it's useful to cover some aspects of ADS safety in this course. In quantum field theory, the fundamental particles are point-like. If particles move, their trajectories are curves, also called word lines. If particles interact, their interaction is in the form of a vertex. As an example, I have the vertex of electromagnetism here, where we have fermions and a gauge boson interacting to the form of a vertex. By contrast, in string theory, the fundamental object is a string. If we look at the movement of strings, then the trajectory of a string is a manifold, also called a world sheet. If the string is open, then the trajectory sort of looks like this sheet here. And if the, if the string is a closed string, then the trajectory will look like a tube. This is to be contrasted with the world line of a point particle that's also highlighted in this slide. If strings interact, the interaction looks different from the vertex. It has this extended form that's more like a tree branch structure. It turns out that string theory can only be consistently formulated in a certain number of space-time dimensions, and those are 10, 11, and 26. For us, the 10 and 11 dimensional string theory formulations will be the most important. In addition to strings, string theory has additional objects, which are called brains. Simply put, brains are places where strings can start and end. So pictorially, if we have closed strings, they sort of um, don't have to interact with D-brains, but we can have open strings that end on one D-brain and, sorry, start on one D-brain and end on the same D-brain, or we can have open strings that end on, start on one D-brain and end on another D-brain. All of these possibilities are possible. The dynamics of string endpoints on a brain are like a charge on, um, are like charges because if we have the dynamics of a charge um, that corresponds to electromagnetism, so the dynamics or the dynamics of a single uh, string endpoint on the brain is like electromagnetism. For this reason, we describe, or we can use it to describe a U1 gauge theory, which is what electromagnetism is. If we have two brains, one can engineer a U2 gauge theory. For three brains, we get U3, and for n of these brains, where n is some number, we get a un gauge theory. The un gauge theory contains an sun gauge theory uh, as part of their um, setup. And this means that if we take a stack of n d3 brains, that we have a correspondence to an sun gauge theory in three plus one dimensions, which is the same gauge group as um, young males um, in, in, in ordinary QCD, for instance. So on the one side, we have these D-brains and we sort of expect them to act like an SUN gauge theory in three plus one dimensions, which is a quantum field theory. So this is some particular um, realm of physics that we care about. Now, how does the gravity description come? It turns out that these D-brains are heavy and a stack of N-D-brains will be even heavier. So it will actually bend space-time. Because it bends space time, we need a general relativity description to describe what's going on. It's simplest to assume maximally symmetric 
uh, stack of n d3 brains. This simplifies um, the calculation as we've done multiple times throughout the course. And it turns out that if we take this maximally symmetric example, the phi theory that we get is a particular SUN gauge theory. It's called n equals four, sorry, the four is missing, um, super Yamil's theory in three plus one dimension. Because it's a maximally symmetric phi theory, also the gravity description that we get from these ND3 brains bending space time also has to be maximally symmetric. It turns out that if we embed these three brains in 10 dimensions as part of 10 dimensional string theory, then the line element for the gravity description factorizes because of the high degree of symmetry. It factorizes into two pieces. There's an S5 corresponding to a five dimensional sphere and an ADS5 part, which corresponds to antidecitor space in five dimensions. It turns out that the metric part corresponding to the S5 just vectors out and does not contribute to the dynamics. What we're left with is the ADS5 part, and we can write down the line element for that part explicitly, um, just recalling our construction of maximally, space time, maximally symmetric space times that we talked about earlier in this course. We can write down the line element for ADS antidecitor space in five dimensions. It has five coordinates. One of them is time and five space coordinates. And then the structure is such that it's divided by uh, one of these coordinates here. L is the radius of the uh, ADS5 uh, part. And uh, this is just the five dimensional analog of the under the state of space times that we talked about earlier in this course. Now this ADS5 space time has a curious feature. If you look at that metric here, it's actually uh, becoming singular close to U is zero. Um, and it turns out that at u is zero, the singularity just means that the space time has a boundary. So it's basically stopping to exist for negative u. Uh, we can define it to be uh, existing only for positive values of this coordinate u, and at u is zero, there's a boundary. This boundary is known as the conformal boundary, and locally, the metric that's corresponding to this um, boundary is just minus the t squared plus the x squared which is nothing else but the Minkowski metric in three plus one dimensions. So this whole 10 dimensional string theory contains somewhere hidden beneath it, a description of um, our usual sort of three dimensional Minkowski space time at the boundary of this higher dimensional space time. There's a lot more to say about the construction of ADS safety for empty space time, but we want to sort of go on and uh, talk about um, actual results or applications of this um, correspondence. To do so, we uh, have to consider more complicated versions. Um, in particular, we want to consider black hole solutions in these ADS space times. The simplest such solution is a black brain. It uh, is similar to a Schwarzschild black hole that we've discussed in cosmology, except that here it's not spherically symmetric. In fact, it is a non-compact black hole, which is just located at a constant value of this coordinate u. So the horizon is just a sheet or a brain, which is called, which is why it's called a black brain. Otherwise, um, there is some clear analogy to uh, our discussion of Schwarzschild black holes. And in particular, we can relate this uh, location of the um, black brain horizon to the temperature, the Hawking temperature of this black brain. And it's given by a similar relation as for the Schwarzschild black hole. US is just given as one over pi times T, where T is the Hawking temperature of the black brain. Diagrammatically, the space time that we are describing now looks like this. At U is zero, we have the conformal boundary. And we sort of interpret this as such that our uh, quantum field theory that we're trying to calculate uh, properties of uh, lives on this boundary here. So this is a four dimensional boundary, three plus one space time dimensions. And then we have this fifth coordinate that tells us that there is a gravity description that's extending, we call it extending into the bulk. And at some value of this coordinate u, um, there will be our black brain that's sitting here. And that's essentially um, blocking any, any information uh, of this to come out, except for Hawking radiation. This is also sometimes why the ADS CFT correspondence is called uh, holography because essentially it, the idea is that 
is a gravity description is like a hologram um, in the sense that all the information that we care about is this quantum field theory on the boundary, but we sort of access it by going to this higher dimensional holographic um, calculation in GR. How can one now use this to calculate anything in the quantum field theory? Uh, let's be a little bit more concrete about this. Recall from lecture 33 that black holes have an entropy that's given by the Bekenstein Hawking formula. S, the entropy given as the area of the black hole divided by four times G, the Newton constant. For the ADS5 black brain, um, the entropy is similar, except that because we're one dimension higher in the gravity description, the area here is really a volume because it's high, one dimension higher. And G is not the usual Newton constant, but it's the five dimensional Newton constant. This five-dimensional Newton constant is linked to the property of the SU and gauge theory through uh, this formula here, which is more non-trivial to derive, but can be done if you um, follow the details of the uh, compactification. And uh, if um, we have this uh, five-dimensional Newton constant, we can plug it into the um, formula for the entropy here. The only thing we still need is the area of the black brain, and uh, that is just the area of this uh, black brain horizon. So this is proportional to the uh, volume of the three-dimensional space-time, the uh, ADS radius L, and the location of the black brain US. Since we know US in terms of the Hawking temperature, we know the area in terms of the temperature of the black brain. And if you plug all of these in, we get the entropy for the black brain. Putting everything together, we get that the entropy of the black brain is given by the volume times uh, a number of factors over here. Dividing by the volume gives us the entropy density little s, which is now pi squared temperature cubed n squared over two. And uh, this is supposed to be a property of the uh, quantum field theory of, um, that, that we're describing using this duality. We can compare this to the entropy density of NA phosphorus u and mills that we can access um, by the weak coupling standard quantum field theory treatment. N equals for superior mills has eight bosons and eight fermion degrees of freedom. For non interacting theory, each of these degrees of freedom contributes the same amount to the entropy density. So it happens that there's a factor of two pi squared t cubed of four over 45 for each boson and a similar amount times seven over eight for each fermion. If we do the math, we find that for free n equals four super mls, the entropy density is given um, by this quantity here, that's just two pi squared t cubed over three. And if we compare with the ADS result that we found for the entropy density of the black brain, we find that these two are not equal. They actually sort of are equal within 25%. Uh, and the interpretation simply is that the ADS CFT result for our entropy density of the black brain corresponds to the strong coupling limit of the quantum field theory. So this is why this ADS CFT uh, calculation has such an important um, implications for our studies of quantum field theory, because that allows us to access the strong coupling region of the quantum field theory, which are usually not accessible with most non-methods. And that completes the lecture.